Brass is always a very different type of musical model than any other band or whatever you want to call it. And it's interesting that the uh, the impact and the effect of Crass has actually grown, in a way, disproportionately over the years, hasn't it? Oh, undoubtedly, yeah. I mean, I think um, it's because it was never quite what it seems. Um, and I, I mean, I was surprised in the day how people were seeing through the surface and understanding the place we were really coming from. And um, it wasn't really, where we were coming from wasn't dis obviously described um, within the content of the work we put out. Um, it was the feeling beneath it, uh, and, and there was multiple little tricks, little games that I certainly played in my lyrics, you know, which actually were telling quite a different message to the one that appeared to be arriving. I mean, most obvious in something like Big A, Little A, which is uh, be exactly who you want to be, blah, blah, blah. Um, very much demonstrated that, you know, that um, this is what we might think or this is what publicly we um, probably are driven to think. But there's always something much deeper than that operating, and that's a sort of inner being, uh, the heart. Um, and I think people picked up on that, and I think that's why it's grown and grown, because there was a reality to it. that, it, I mean, politics have got no reality. We know that. I mean, and quite apart from the fact that politics is now corporate business, you know, pushing weaker people into stronger positions um, because that, that's the most convenient way of operating. You know, you only need to look at America. Any government actually is led by very weak people. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, that's the sort of picture. So in, in a way, there was a spirit, spirituality to cross. It was filling a spiritual void in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, I don't. I've never liked particularly like the word spiritual, but yes, uh, there isn't any. Probably, I mean, I actually think divine is better. I mean, I'm certainly not religious, but I, you know, the idea of divine space, uh, divine space is what the um, quantum physicists are now talking about, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the symbiotic whole, whatever you want to call it, um, and yes, and. Uh, I think that's an absolute unstoppable force because it actually is the nearest we can possibly come to reality, dancing particles. Um, how they dance and where they dance is probably more dependent on whatever psychology we've adopted or constructed for ourselves and has very, very little um, true reality. Um, so, in a, so in a sense, it was filling a scientific and a philosophy void in the late 70s, early 80s. The meeting yeah. point, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that's explosive, and it comes in tiny little pieces. I mean, I was looking at the snowdrops pushing through in the garden, and there's one little group which has never extended more than about four blossoms. And it, it, it grows in, in, in an extremely hostile area. It's right near a big pot. It's always flooded. I mean, it shouldn't be growing there. But every year, for as long as I can remember, you know, over 50 years, this little thing, and it never grows, it never expands, it just is. You know, obviously, clearly has no ambition. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> want to cover a mountainside. It's very in its own place. And, um, yeah, it's just that. So, so, would it, so would crass be those snowdrops, in a sense? Yeah. 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 I, I like that analogy. Analogy is really nice. Yeah, really cool. I guess the thing about crass, it, it affected a lot of people in very different ways, didn't it? I mean, for some people... There was a visceral experience of crass. For some people, there was a deeper experience. For some people, it was 
uh, a chance to expand their own perceived political palette. And yeah. is, are all those that valid reactions for you? Any reaction is valid, you know, whether it's negative or positive. I mean, it's a reaction. And um, the more fierce the reaction, probably the, the more positive the result. I mean, I'm not, don't choose to be judgmental about politics because politics is all one thing. It's slavery. Um, and a, a slavery which we seem appear to accept, you know, without question. Um, and attempting to sort of change politics is like sort of changing your head, you know, cut this one on, put another one on. Well, I mean, it, it's not a sort of practical approach to life. Um, <laughs> I mean, do you think it's, um, in a way, Crass has provided, of course, is providing questions, but also providing some kind of answers? Or, or is it up to the listener to provide their own answers? You were just. Impetus. Yeah. To provide impetus, you know, and where that goes is unpredictable. It's not my business, actually. Um, I still, I, I, you know, the work I do now continues in exactly the same vein basically presenting riddles i mean it was a riddle that crass did look like a sort of neo-nazi outfit uh, particularly you know in the fairly early days when the stuff was still actually whole and started falling apart but um and that was a riddle we were how 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 come these people are eating marmite sandwiches and sharing tea with everyone how come they etc cetera, etc cetera? they're not things that are obvious but but that but that that was the reality of it. You know, we didn't hold back. You know, on the one hand, we were sort of these sort of uh, apparently sort of neo-Nazi outfit. Yet we we got down. You know, amongst the audience, we were the audience. That's why we didn't because we didn't see there was any difference. You know, we weren't a show. It was an event uh, of which we were a part. Sometimes we created that event, it's true, but I mean, the intention was quite simply that people would all gather together and we'd sort it out somehow, you know, not in a political sense, but in a real sense, you know, this touches me, you know, the thing, the things that touch you are irrefutable. Um, and I, I, I don't really believe that I don't believe in evil uh, at all. You know, we're touched in a way. Well, our psychology chooses how it will react to what we feel. And actually, that can go anyway. It can go into pure love or pure nastiness. There's no telling. It's our psychology that is determining that, which is precisely why I don't believe in psychology. And saying that meaning that I... Um, I think psychological reaction is purely conditioned. It will inevitably reflect the more, you know, the current mores, um, social mores, um, and has actually in no way at all represents one's feelings. What all that is, is being manifest is your psychological reaction to feeling so your dad used to beat you up you know, when you was a kid or you made love to a pig when you were 94 whatever it is that what the feeling that comes from us is the psychological judgments made and psychology is a construct the whole brain process is a construct they talk about artificial intelligence well actually our intelligence if it's one based around uh, consensual views, is utterly artificial. It's not only artificial, it's superficial. Um, in fact, artificial intelligence, if you're going to talk about intelligence, is probably more real because it's so mechanical. It's just, a, you know, like a Lego kit. You know, well, we're not Lego kits, but <laughs> what we've done is, 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 Rather than using consciousness in an inner and thus 
expansive way, we use it as an outer and therefore depleting way. It's inevitable. You can't put all, you know, I look out the window, there's a horse going across in the field with the trees, blah, blah, blah. I can't put that down into a sort of few words. Um, I can write metaphoric po poetry, but I can't, you can't reduce that. But that's precisely what we're taught from the very beginning. Reductive thought, you know, cut down on it. That's a tree, that's a pony, that's a... And they're separate. They're not one of the same thing. Well, actually, they must be one and the same thing because they're one and the same thing right now before my very eyes. So do you think, in, in a sense, that art, music, brass even, uh, is uh, a channel to the, the inner psyche, you know, the, you know, the, 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 real, the real thing that's inside you, not, not the, the surface, not the artificial, the, the fleshy artificial intelligence? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do I think it? It's it's a pathway to get there, or it's a reflection of artists, it. Or it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Creativity, yeah. yeah. But that creativity can just as much be bread making, or poetry, or log chopping, or whatever. You know, it, it, there's no difference. If one's in that place, then there's no difference. You're making love. At, all moments you know it's a love that calls no name it's um it doesn't distinguish one thing from another because you know this is a great big particle dance um and the less we can see it um as solid defined matter then actually the closer we are to the divine I'm, I'm, and again, I'll say I'm not using that in the religious sense. So in a sense, it's a way to be in tune, not only with yourself and your inner self, but in tune with the universe. Well, your inner self is the universe, so uh, there isn't any inner self. You know, that sort of division is created purely and manifested purely within the sort of materialist world. And it's all a construct. So would you say that your art or chopping wood or playing drums in crass is part of that process to get yeah. beyond, you know, beyond the kind of facile construct of the everyday? Well, when I was a drummer in crass, I was still muddled about getting beyond. You know, I was still aspired to, towards that. <clears throat> and, you know, over the 50 years, 40 years since crass, you know, my entire energy has been put towards answering you know one of the conundrums we presented or i presented within crass was that there is no authority but yourself uh, but i failed to ask the important question around that who is that self or what is that <laughs> self um <clears throat> and the self is an aspiring thing but it's always heading in the wrong direction um, it's heading in trying to build. You can't negate by by um, a, a, through addition, you know. So I spent a lot of time sitting around rereading old Zen books and that sort of stuff, you know. Uh, after when I got the space after we we. Um, um, uh, after the band broke up, that, that gave a new space. And my journey was to see how I could get to something which I could call real. Um, and the first thing, obviously, was to look at the self. And progressively, I've learned that the self isn't even there. That's the delusion. There is no self. The self is a construct. The ego, I mean, as Sartre said, you know, the ego is every bit as much a construct as just about anything else. Um, so, and that therefore suggests a nothingness. Well, uh, there's two absolutes. You know, there's everything which must contain nothing. So there's nothing which must contain everything. So there's actually nothing or everything, but actually they're an equal force. 
And that's not looking at positive negative. It's looking at something and nothing. Um, you know, you can't judge that. Um, I sort of feel now that I drift between a something, which I'm doing at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm, man I'm, I'm deliberately manifesting. <laughs> um, and when I'm, you know, after this, I'll go and chop some wood or make bread or write a poem or whatever I do. And then I'm not, not manifesting. Um, I'm unaware of what, effectively unaware of what I'm doing. Um, and there's all there's a lot of this sort of mindfulness um, term, which I have to say, a lot of people who t look, promote mindfulness would probably agree with me, is that actually the mind is a manacle. So why on earth do you want mindfulness? Um, what you want is emptiness, because um, that allows for, for whatever's happening to happen. Um, and un uh, emptiness inevitably and obviously is unjudgmental. It can't be judgmental. So all of those questions about one's inner being, about good and bad, am I an evil person, not just fall away. They must do. But uh, with, you, that yeah. comes a, with that comes yeah, a sort of yeah. form of deep responsibility. If one's going to step into the material world for one reason or another, like I'm doing at the moment, then there's a huge responsibility to avoid adding to the delusion of reality. I mean, I argue with the Buddhists in the sense that they say that, um, uh, that the material world is an illusion. I don't think it's an illusion. It's a delusion. It, we are responsible for that, not it. You know, it's not something, it has no opinion, it just drifts, it does what it does, as do we. And if we want to sort of make some sort of novel out of that, which it, the ego is a sort of novel writer, You're pretty bad, pretty poor quality as well, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, and that's, if we want to live in a story, fine, but that's not my idea of existence. And also, there's no question, and I'm, you know, I'm not putting this forward in any form of life after death thing, um, all that sort of nonsense, which I think is nonsense. Trying to put that into some sort of material interpretation. Of course, we are immortal. We're immortal because we're dancing particle, and that will <clears throat> forever be. Uh, it's infinite, immortal non-directional uh like time time doesn't exist time is multi-directional all the time the psychological version of that is past and future what a load of nonsense and now so it purports that this multi-directional thing or not thing <laughs> multi-directional <laughs> nothing um is can somehow be in caged so that we can then practice order, except all of these things which are utterly uh, opposed to nature. Nature being the closest we come to nature in terms of the material world is probably quantum physics, which talks about the dancing particles, which understands nothingness, which un et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there are no questions to ask um, within that domain, which is why one can find you've been sat for eight hours just peering at a stone on the floor and being unaware of time, being unaware of anything. You simply have become that stone on the floor, which is you've simply become the floor. You've simply... You've expanded into the infinite possibility and infinite beauty of the undefined world. You become the dancing particles without the distractions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. It's really interesting that, but Penny, because I actually know quite a few scientists at CERN who, you know, the university, you know, the universe yeah. scientists, you know, and they, they, of course, they're the particle scientists. They study the neutrinos, the quarks, all that. And it's exactly the same conversation. And you yeah. kind of ride at the same point by a very different route. Yeah. And I, one, I think that's why. All my life, I've never bought into anything, you know, from a very early age where I thought, no, I really don't like the look of this. You know, this is, you know, this was in conversations with my father more than anything. You know, if this is the real world you talk about, count me out. And, you know, I've actively counted myself out since I was probably age six or something. Looking for something that actually made any sense at all. Um... You know, over the years, I've used different terms to things that appear to make sense. I mean, love was the obvious one, and that tied in very well with the movement that developed 20 years on in my life in the hippie movement. You know, peace and love, man. You know, well, yeah, of course, that's beautiful. But there are always questions that have to be asked there. You can't. Otherwise, you just become another form of opposition. Uh, that's why I've not particularly enthusiastic about millions of people marching along the street shouting slogans it's just a it actually compounds what it what it claims to be opposing it's part of the theater it's, yes it gives credibility um and when you look at these sort of unbelievable arrogance which is which that particularly these recent marches the unbelievable arrogance of governments, notably American and British government. Yes, I mean, within material sense, it's utterly shocking. It's unbelievable, but totally believable. We've seen it all before. You know, the Iraq war, huge, not so many people, but huge marches. All they do is actually confirm the power. They're Nuremberg rallies, really. Mm. I mean, and it's just this kind of quest. For all your life, you've been on this journey, haven't you? And I, I mean, you would not be so arrogant to be. Of course, you're not so arrogant to presume you've got the answer. But each mm -hmm. part of your life, each chapter of it, each um, road you've been up to, is the journey to get to this point, to get to this way of thinking. Is it stripping away the the uh, imposing? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, actually, there's a point at which you stop looking. I stopped looking for answers because there are none. I began realizing, well, you know, answers are just opinion. You know, that they have no actual value beyond the person who's manifesting them. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't, I, I certainly would say that for the last, well, probably all this century, I have not been looking for answers. You know, I've been looking quite the opposite. Um, I mean, I came up with a line yesterday, it's probably a, a, a quote from somewhere else, but it was just, a, you know, a love that calls no name. Um, and that's different, you know, like when if you, if, if, in, the, in the 60s, uh, sort of, you know, acknowledged and brought in to a lot of the love speak of the day. Uh, but it was, it, it, it always had that sort of tinge of my love. Well, I'm not actually interested in my love. If it's my love, it isn't love. Um, it's only in, in the, as you know, the Mayans greeting in the morning is I am thou as thou art I. Well, that's what I, I believe. I not only believe it, I know it. Um, my reaction tends to be, well, if you don't want to be that, well, fine, but I can't, I can't attach. You know, I, I mean, I, in that way, in the material sense, I'm probably slightly intolerant. Intolerant of fools. If people want to ignore the obvious, common, inevitable beingness, which is indefinable, blah, 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 has no name, blah, 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 then it's not that, I mean, I don't 
disdain them. I just have got nothing to say. There is nothing to be said. If people are going to, to, to take anything I might do and try to trick, trick me and it into some sort of material form, then I'm not, I'm not by their side. I can't be. Uh, and that's not aggressive or anything. It's quite simply, hang on, I, I haven't got the time to waste here. And that's why I don't read newspapers. That's why I don't watch the news. I mean, I inform myself. Um, often it's by someone else mentioning something. I'll go, oh, well, I, you know, I'll look into that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, so it's effect effectively disengagement from something which has actually no reality. And at first, one's thinking, oh, well, you are. I, I don't I need that bit of it, or, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Realising, actually, you don't, because it is. You know, it's, accent don't need yeah, it's accentuated don't by getting older, you know, just the feeling there is, you know, less time for distraction. Or is it just because that's, that's what the way you're thinking? You know, you think that those things are the theatre of distraction that get in the way of the real message. I think it's a, it's a matter of in ter in terms of keeping going, um, you know, I aging. Um, when I read what uh, I was reading them the other day, you know, the things I uh, acts of love, you know, and the stuff is not that different to what I say now. The only difference, the real difference, is that at that time I was aspiring towards what. What the things I'm talking about in acts of love, and those things are just a, a totally accepted beingness, an itness now, you know. And I can, and 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 my job within the material world is to, con you know, is exactly the same job as I've done since I was six or so, and that is is offering, finding, and offering. Little uh, koans, really, you know, to trick people into thinking in a new way, if you like. And actually, thinking in a new way is probably necessary to arrive at thinking no way. Uh, and that's, and in thinking no way, one actually suddenly exists. So, in a sense, you know, uh, like 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 a a, a, a jester, like a poetic jester, um, putting out little tripwires there to make people go, "Whoa!" <laughs> I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And the Joker, in, the Joker, or the trickster in the court, actually was the one, as Shakespeare has demonstrated, who had normally perceived the situation in in a right manner. Mm. Um, and they were, I mean, the fool was called upon to actually describe what's going on effectively. Yeah, and, and you, couldn't say, you couldn't say it straight because you get your head chopped off, so it was yeah. disguised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, when you look at your sort of uh, your life journey, like um, your art journey or art music, is it a linear process, or is it, it kind of goes, it kind of lurches from one side to another? Sometimes you go up a complete cul-de-sac and get stuck, or all the no. are they all little steps that build upon each other? I don't see them. I don't believe in progress. For example, uh, I believe in isness. Um, and I think, you know, by by mistake, you know, I probably adopted isness when I was a child. You know, this this is working. I'm not I don't you know, I'm I'm gonna bunk off school today and just walk in the forest or something, which wasn't, you know, it wasn't a huge intellectual decision, I think. It's just what I wanted to do, so I did it. And uh I can't say anything's different now. If I want to do it, I'll do it. Um, but and but that want mustn't come through need. Um, you know, I hate having to do things that I need to do. I hate being driven to that point because it's 
Um, we, I shouldn't need to make bread today, for example, because that simply proves that I haven't acknowledged um, that it will be wanted. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm no, maybe I'm joking around too much here, but I think there's a big difference. Um, filling the holes, if you like. Do you think, in a sense, uh, crass has become a distraction to what what your to your journey? You know, because it's because it is the best known part of it, but it's not the whole part. It's a small, creatively, it's a smallish yeah. part of it, isn't it? And it's um, and it's the yeah. perception of what what it is and what it was is part of the journey, but not the whole journey, is it? No, oh, absolutely, no, no. I mean, I, I, um, um, I mean, I'm no different. Uh, you know, I've learned more, maybe, um, or to put it better, I've learned less, probably. <laughs> um, but you know, I, my the process hasn't changed one iota. Um, and you know, like, we'll go to that trickster thing again. I mean, I, uh, you know, I don't normally talk. I don't do anecdotes too well because I'm not really interested in them. But, you know, an example of that was when I won that Beatles painting competition. Uh, my choice of albums was Shostakovich and Charlie Mingus. Uh, well, that is that was a glorious opportunity to play the trickster. And it worked. If you look at John's face, his response, uh, when when I said what, what what I chose, you know, he's he's baffled for a while. Mm. It's not very long. Then he picks up his sort of cover again. But um, and that that's a sort of existent demonstration of exactly that choice. I mean, I happen to like Shostakovich and Mingus, but by rights, I should have chosen two Beatles records because I entered for <laughs> the competition i wasn't a fan of theirs anymore because i thought they'd gone teeny pop sort of stuff but my sister was younger than me was a great fan and that's why i did went in for the competition because i knew i'd win it um and then i could take her up to ready steady go as it was she was doing a choral something in the convent she was at so she couldn't come anywhere but <laughs> <laughs> do you think uh, pop culture was a good place for the trickster, you know, and Crass was was a very good place for the trickster. Hmm. Mm. But I don't I think we very quickly um moved out of the sort of pop culture with Crass. I mean I initially that was there. I mean, I mean Steve always um says that you know feeding is his favourite album and it was it was more fun there's no question and we were having a bit of a laugh there's no question all that sort of stuff well the laughs wore thin pretty bloody quickly um and you know i i really respect that steve kept going with something which fundamentally wasn't where he wanted to go um you know he, wa he wanted more of the, the fun and a mm. little less of the angst uh, and I completely understand that. I mean, he was, he was a young man at the time, very young man, mm. um, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I can't remember why I was saying that, but anyway, yeah. The trick is it the tricks that could be more effective with both angst and the fun. That's probably why yeah. class worked. And that's because the angst and the fun was there, both the scales were weighed perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, uh, well, I mean, and uh, in a way, you know, um, an unconventional line of old, much older people, younger people, different classes, um, different attitudes, actually managing to work together. You know, well, that in itself is tricking the scales. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, if Steve had been left to find like minded people, it would have been a sort of jam sort of band maybe something like that if i'd been left to my own devices it would have been a sort of i don't know you know a, di a different kind of jam that they uh, you were saying that the physicists that you knew were coming from a very similar angle to what i was talking about 
And I was thinking about how there's no, the only way is your own way. Um, and the physicists will never actually arrive there because, you know, it, it is actually, it works within a material framework, a materialist framework. So actually, in the end, they can't get there. I mean, they always get stuck at the Big Bang because they can't go through, you know, can't go through to the other side. Um, you know, and that's where time comes into it. They have to work within time because otherwise they can't work. So, so there are certain structures, which is not to in any way um, diss them at all. I mean, I really, I really Thank enjoy it. I know it's really interesting. And actually, quite a few of them I spoke to are actually going beyond that point now. That's what's yes, that's where it's interesting. This is where yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know they, they think maybe the Big Bang didn't happen. They talk about how time doesn't really exist. And mm-hmm. they talk about the thing that we're all spin particles. And mm-hmm. you know that that when you die, the afterlife, whatever, is actually all the energy is constant in the universe. So your energy yeah, just yeah. goes back to the universe, which is kind of a sense, a after an afterlife and yeah, all yeah, matter yeah. stays the same in the universe. Yeah. So yeah. It, mm. There are points where all this crosses over, but what be re- what's interesting here is um, what 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 kind of mindset, what kind of thinking, what kind of discipline or, or non-discipline or anti-discipline is the best way to get to this to the point of unra- of thought? Is it art, music, science? No, uh, what I think I'm saying, was so, you, yeah, you won't get to it. I mean, one of the my, one of my things in life is, for example, I read that physics, uh, uh, that form of physics. I read a lot of um, sort of Zeni and Taoist books and all that sort of stuff. But I, if I can't recognize it, there's no point in reading it. Uh, because I, I profoundly believe, it's the same with medicine, for example, I profoundly believe that we are our own healer. And by going to the doctor, we're actually handing something of 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 our being not it's got nothing to do with egos or ideas of self it's to do with our natural belonging um within all this we are all this then why step out you know to the moment you start coping with things you you have ceased to be them um and things aren't messages but you know in materialists that's the word messaging you know like animals message you know animal, animals tell a story everything tells a story uh ultimately they're all telling the same story once you once one is able to understand what everything's saying they're all saying i'm you you are me you know this you you try and you try and create otherwise um so the point i i think i was trying to get to is that that, is that uh i mean i have no time for psychedelics for example quite simply because i think they take people on the journey but people aren't looking out the window um it's the utter difference to you know without going out without going out of my door so etc etc it's the opposite to that um and I don't, I'm not, I'm not critical of the short term results. You know, people might be able to see there's a little bit more than they imagined was there, but they don't know how they got there. And I've, I know many people who sort of spent rather too much of their lives on acid who really have suffered as a result. They're lost. Mm-hmm. You know, that they know the divine, but they don't know how to get there. They don't I mean, realise that yeah. they are it. So when you look back at your journey through your life, and I guess you tried all these different things, you know, music, no, art, so you didn't go do because you saw the damage you did to people, I suppose. But um, yeah, yeah it was were all these things like little doors, doors of perception or whatever. That sometimes it was a wrong door, and look, you didn't go through that door. Or all mm. these just different ways to try and get to the point where you you're close, getting now. We're not arrogant to say that you're actually there, but you know, 
Well, were these all ways of facilitating the process, different ways? Yes, but I mean, I realise an awful lot of them defacilitated it because as long as you're sort of thinking about it, it's a bit like meditation. If you think you're meditating, you're not meditating. Hmm. Um, hmm. Simple as that. Um, so, <clears throat> and I, I mean, that's why, you know, if I practice anything, it's Wu Wei, which is the practice of nothing, um, nothing doing. Um, it's the uh, uh, the art of nothingness, you know, whatever you want to call it, art of dying, um, and it's unpresence. Well, unpresence is total presence. You know, it, it, where is where are those particles gone in periods of unpresence? They've gone into the great universe. You know, where everywhere and nowhere. So, in a sense, the ultimate sense. The ultimate space to be in when you're unknowing is actually death itself. Would that be the final part of the process? No, it's actually the process that we are currently existent within but like to ignore. Uh, we're dead already. I mean, <laughs> nothing's changed. Nothing changed through our birth and nothing will change through our death. So we are part of that whole process. We're not even a process. We're part of this timelessness. Um, and, I mean, I that was one of the points I found great peace with in, you know, probably you know, a good few years back now. But, you know, it wasn't an awareness, because an, an awareness is some sort of cognitive uh, mind trip. It was a feeling. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, which I couldn't define. It was. It was. It was a feeling, and I knew from then on. I knew that, and it and it and it erased things like fear. I mean, I never had too much fear anyway, because I always thought it was some sort of trick that was being played on me, like nuclear bombs or whatever you want to talk about. Um, yeah, it. It, it's there and it's never been any different. Yeah. And actually, there's nothing there and it's never been any different. Or there's everything there and it's never been any It makes no difference. There's two absolutes, everything and nothing. So you, when you said the, there was a point in your life you got the closest to this, what was that point? Was it, was it random or was it something that you could actually make? You did a little journey, you got to that point, or is it just something... You're walking down the street and you thought, oh, yeah, I've got it. <laughs> is it. Or is it flicker on and off all the time? No, no I mean, it sort of it came, it came out. Um, I guess it came through meditation. I've been meditating seriously for about the last, I suppose, 10, 15 years, something like that. And I think it just arrived through that, you know, um, so sort of maybe getting off my stool one day and not noticing the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hadn't been meditating, hadn't been anywhere. Uh, I mean, meditation is a glorious way of being nowhere. Uh, and then, sly, uh, you know, then that nowhere starts crystallizing around you, you know, and um, that's what I really feel now. I mean, I can, uh, <coughs> I mean, just as we get switched off by Zoom, we can switch off. Well, actually, that's you. We can't. Um, we're not fucking algorithms. We're not. Um, we're not any of that stuff. Um, because of the monkey mind. Because yeah, yeah, just the way we are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's not, you know, on that <coughs> people. people I'm asked often, well, don't you don't you find that a bit boring, or isn't it a bit negative? And you know, what about Gaza? Um, I mean, for example, I spent about a week listening to um, people talking, um, Palestinians talking about Gaza, and Israelis talking about Gaza, and they all made complete sense. I might not have agreed with what they had to say, but they made complete sense. Um, and the danger is deciding to take sides within all that because 
inevitably you will be compounding something in, by so doing. It's not the right way. It, uh, uh, I mean, on the days day of that last very big march, I, I did a three-hour meditation um, rather than go on the march, which I thought was an important march. It was very, you know, it was before the South African thing and was huge, that, that very, very huge, the biggest march. And I sort of thought, I can, that's my contribution, uh, if you like. You know, it's a material. I'm using my meditation in a sort of materialist way. I mean, the moment I'm sat down, all of that goes away. Um, it wasn't in my head. And that, I think that wasn't in my headness is probably the very truth of compassion. I don't think that we can adopt compassion in the same way as we can empathy. We can adopt empathy. We can try to be kinder. We can try to be more understanding. We can pretend we can get into other people's heads, et cetera, et cetera. Compassion is nothing like that. In fact, it, it, it's quite brutal. It's quite brutal because it quite simply will not listen to opinion. It can't listen to opinion, because all opinions are right from the mouth of the opinionator. Mm. And that's, no, you know, you're right off to get in nowhere. I mean, you're not actually you're doing the opposite. <laughs> getting in nowhere <laughs> in the terms I use. You're heading somewhere, and it's very dark. Um, yeah. But, what, what would you say to the people who... I mean, crass, the, the pacifism thing, crass, is really important. And I think that changed a lot of people's mindsets. But I'm sure, I think quite a lot of them would have been on that march and would have been, I don't know, they wouldn't be expecting you to lead the march, of course not. But would they, would, if they had expectations of you to take sides or to think one side was right and one side was wrong, would you think they, they kind of misinterpreted or misunderstood what crass was saying in the first place? Very slightly, yeah. Yeah, it would. Um, you know, we're bigger than that. We're, we're, we are the universe. So what are we... Uh, I mean, I've got indoor plants, you know, and indoor plants need looking after. Most of the stuff outside there doesn't need looking after. You know, and whereas the outdoor plants are, you know, just taking their chances in nature. Um these indoor plants is taking my interference with nature. So I have to be a sort of surrogate nature. I have to be surrogate rain or surrogate feed to help them do whatever they want to do. And that's an assumption, actually. Um, but so, and I think that's the process. I think that nature's getting on with it fine. You know, we might not like climate change, but actually it's getting on fine. You know, nature doesn't care a sort of it makes polar bears extinct it's not interested you know we're not it, it isn't cuddly bear land it's the ferocious and very real if you like particle interaction um it doesn't exist and it totally exists and it exists on its own terms you know we alone seem to believe that we can add something more to the more sort of sugar in the tea sort of thing. Well, we can't, and we never have done. I mean, the current sort of demise, you, you can, well, you can trace it back, obviously, to the Industrial Revolution, and then trace it back to Descartes, or, you know, tra trace it back to the Greeks. It's a shockingly bad trajectory. Um, you know, it's a badly told story, you know. Um, and given that our entire, so much of our in culture, the narrative is based around Greek thought, Greek attitudes, which were introduced. There were other things going on at the time. Things in the East were very different at the same, during the same period. I mean, Lao Tzu was sort of saying, well, there's nothing actually there. What are you looking for? 
uh, you know, <laughs> before Christ walked the waters or whatever he did, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we just so, the, the material world is a shockingly bad construct. So would it, would your philosophy align more with China, the Chinese thinkers and the Greek thinkers, or was some of the Greek thinkers like I can never remember his name, but the uh, um, the Correct. cynics? Well, who's the one oh, who lived the in cynic, the, the cynics and the Stoics? Yeah, I can sort of. Who's um, the one who lived in the barrel? Who who always yeah, confounded everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I actually think you're him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, uh, I think I think there's sort of if you if one reads Lao Tzu's philosophy, then you realise if you understand it, you simply understand that there's nothing there. And he actually says that effectively. You know, don't listen to me. You know, I don't know anything. Um, and then proceeds, as I do. I mean, I say there's nothing to say and then talk for four and a half hours or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> um, and what one's, what one's looking for is the break. Uh, you know, that little, the little snap, you know, the, in uh, in most one-to-one -one conversations, you know, sitting around the table here, there'll be a moment where everything goes... You can feel it. I'm sure you experience it. Just that, and actually, you know, and some the the most nervous who's sitting around will interject with some stupid, banal comment because they can't bear the absolute nature of what he found them, and they and and that giggles. They'll get the giggles or make some silly remark to get off the hook. Whoa, you know, I don't like the look of that. There's nothing there. Um, and I've experienced that so many times, and it's being able to concentrate, hold that silence, and then it starts creeping in from nowhere. Nature starts working, and sort of it's like putting a seed into the ground, and it, you know, it starts. Ooh, you know, first of all, it's a little fairly internal thing, and then, ooh, wow, you know, and it's actually all just there. So would you say, in the sense that all your arts, creativity, whatever you want to call it, is an attempt to find that moment, that perfect moment? No, it isn't an attempt to find that perfect moment at all. It's 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 an attempt to help towards that, not that moment, but that actually that it that exists beyond that moment. You know, in other words, nothing. Um, and I think that I think I could, you know, within material terms, very arrogantly claim that that's where I exist. I exist nowhere. I know the nature of nowhere. And I accept the nature or know the nature that nowhere is everywhere. I accept that you are I and I am you. And it's not, that's my ego talking, saying that. And it doesn't like saying it because it would rather, you know, be saying, oh, well, uh, my latest album is uh, such and such. And, you know, oh, yeah, well, I was talking to Johnny Depp the other day or whatever it is. You know, all the anecdotes that we tell. I mean, I did it a bit in telling my anecdote with Lennon. You know, it was sort of an attempt to demonstrate something, but. I mean, if an anecdote isn't, if an ane most anecdotes are sort of simply ego enhancers, you know, I'm feeling a bit down, I'll throw something in, I'm here, I'm, I'm important, I should be listened to, all that sort of nonsense. But, um, I mean, anecdotes sometimes can sort of describe an event, you know, we, what we were talking about, about the fools, weren't there, fools in the, in the court and that sort of stuff, trickery and stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've just, I've just remembered the Greek philosopher's name, actually. He's Diogenes. Oh, yeah, right, correct, yeah, yeah. So would, mm. would you would you say, I mean, because he thought, I mean, he did the, the fool thing as well, didn't he? So and mm. he, would, he, he would say something that was like, it was kind of a riddle, but it made sense, and it confounded yeah. people, and it, it broke expectations, it broke the path they were on. Would you say that is partially something that, that you would do, or is it just because... Oh, yeah. 
No, I definitely. I mean, uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's what, what I think we did talk about, you know, was trickery. Yeah, I mean, I'm involved in that. So it's, it, well, I mean, in, in Zen, it's called koans, you know, you're presented with some impossible a sound of one hand clapping and told to go away and think about it. Mm. Um, well, that's the mistake, is going away and thinking about it. Just go away. There's nothing to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had exactly that. Uh, on a, on a retreat, and you know, you get you get a sort of um, audience with the uh, with the master. So, and you're not meant to speak until you're spoken to, and you're meditating about you know, almost head to head, you know, sort of one to one. And I was asked the question: Have you got anything to say? You're not allowed to talk unless you're asked. So I actually didn't have anything to say. You know, I was sitting there. I was comfortable enough. And after about half an hour, I suppose, I thought, I don't know. I mean, I wonder if he's getting bored sort of thing. I mean, I don't think I was getting bored. But I sort of started, you know, it was a wrong thing to do. I started feeling sort of slightly responsible. And so I said no. And immediately put his hand down, rung the little bell, which means you're dismissed. Wrong answer. And I did realise. Uh, well, I went and I was I was felt well nobbled by that. I mean, this is when I was still attached to Zen. I might point out. Um, and um, I I went away and I sort of sat around. And then I suddenly went, no, well, I should have said yes. And then he would have said, well, what have you got to say? And I'd have said no. So I made a mis I made actually it was a sort of technical mistake. But obviously, if I hadn't got anything to say, I hadn't anything to say. So I, so I should have said yes and then no rather than no, because in saying no, I was saying something. It's, saying like, yes, a huh? it's like a game of psychic chess. <laughs> yes, it was, absolutely. and. Um, and that's the sort of that's the game that goes on um, with, with trickery, and I, I sort of appreciate it. Um, I mean, I really, I mean, the greatest Zen trip for me was my heart attack, which came from nowhere um, and completely knocked Zen off its feet. You know, I mean, I sat on the bench on Rochdale Station, pouring sweat and not knowing what was going on. The train I was meant to be getting on arrived and then pulled out with me getting further into deep sweat and confusion. But I do feel, I didn't see it, but I felt that I got on that train. And what got on that train was a whole series of conceits about my being an existent form uh, uh, notably about I was getting a little bit cocky with have I spoken with you before about this no but I, I know about the Easter but not all the detail of it no no yeah well I, I I mean I had the feeling that I had got on the train uh, along with all my baggage you know and all that was left was this sort of near empty shell I mean I didn't understand what was going on I was too confused and sweaty and uncomfortable you know, and then the ambulance people turned up and took me away. But I um I sort of felt very much that that didn't come from nowhere and and, and the surgeon who put a stent on into my heart said, Well you, your your um arteries are really good, you know, they're absolutely clean. Uh but there was one little tiny little thing that had got in and uh, what was relevant was I felt that I had been getting into Zen. I was getting into, this was after, you know, that audience with the master. And he was all fucking eager. You know, I, I, I'd gotten into Zen. And, oh, yeah, I'm heading somewhere really deep and wild. And actually, I, what I was really doing was thinking, oh, I could become a Zen master, you know. I think oh, you know, all that sort of vanities had, had come to play. And I think I think that was the cause, you know. The body found some way of dealing with 
with with with my arrogance in the same it way not, as you know. It knocks you climate. off your perch. Yeah. yeah, it knocked me off my perch in the same way as I think, you know, things like climate change is nature doing its job. You know, we're not we're not free of that. Uh if ever I have an accident, I immediately look to the point just before it, to, and usually there's a pretty obvious explanation there. Mm. You know, thinking in the wrong direction, making the wrong move, not, you know, making a conceived move where actually an, a non conceived move, as Tai Chi teaches, natural move, you know. Um, yeah, so it's. So it's always um, it's it's always the journey is to absolve yourself of the, of the distractions, isn't it? That's what that's what the lesson is here, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Don't be tricked by it. <laughs> Don't be tricked by the material world. Mm. It's very brutal. In it, in it, in it, uh, it can be very brutal to maintain your presence within it. it doesn't want to let you go. That's your ego. <laughs> And do you think a lot of people understood this from Crass, or a lot of people took different different things from Crass? You know, um, I mean, they're all. I mean, for a lot of people, it's very positive in their lives, but in very different ways. Want it? You know, they perceived you. Does it matter really? Does it matter what people perceive Crass was, or if people had any idea of what it was all about? Uh, well, anyone doesn't know, but the. I mean, people took it wherever they wanted or needed to take it. I mean, I might not um, appreciate their choices, but that's their business, not mine. Um, and I, I suppose I've tried to narrow down and narrow down with my, with my output. I mean, my tweeting, you know, where I do a daily aphorism when, when I can, which is most days. You know, are all, and you know, that's what I got to offer today. And they're all about the same thing: is look at yourself, see you're not there, and then start moving. Because you can't move until you see you're not there to move. Um, you can't go anywhere if you're looking at, looking for anything. Uh, you're, uh, if you think you're meditating, you're not. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, by, by by the same token, uh, you you personally, Penny, have to be detached from crass as well. Well, I'm certainly not attached to them. No, yeah, and I, I am in, in that sense. I'm in no way attached to them. I mean, that doesn't prevent me from sort of doing a whole series of re-releases, and you know, and I and I think that has value. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you look at the average journey, I mean, you start, you know. The, People of the age group that are attracted, let's say, you know, to that sort of thing, are between fourteen and twenty-five, twenty-six. Is would be would have been the the average age of the people who really turned on big. Well, that's really the period of our life when we're really making the most important decisions. Um, you know, and this is in a material sense, but we're, we're trying to make the important decisions by which we can create a life that is sustainable for us uh, in all different sorts of ways. I'm you know, not talking eco-sustainable today. Um, so that was the audience that picked up, or the, uh, the friends, or the associates that picked up on what was going on, and they've used it as they will. but. And I think, and and I, you know, I know that an awful lot of people still, um, you know, um, want to know what I'm thinking. I mean, my twittering proves that to me. I, don't, I never make personal remarks or anything. I just, you know, that tree's, you know, da da sort of stuff. And uh, I actually think that that is. It's as uh, it's a harder commitment than Crass was in a funny sort of way. I'm on my own. I don't, you know, I'm not thinking up aphorisms all the time. I, aphorisms come out of contemplation. I, I normally meditate in the morning and then I contemplate and they just appear. I don't say, oh, I ought to this or I ought to that. 
So they're coming from the space I exist in beyond the material world or without the material world, however you want to say it. I mean, sometimes some of them, because I've been drawn heavily into the material world, like like after two weeks of listening to Palestinian and Israeli opinions, uh, you know, I, they're quite ripe in my head. You know, so probably the aphorisms during that period have got slight. They have to have the sound of one happy uh, of, of, of the sound of one hand clapping element. Otherwise, then they have to have a little twist. They have to have a trick, um, and that's a, actually in a funny way. It's a far deeper commitment than Crass was. It was easy to sit down and write Band from the Roxy. Or, um, I mean, Reality Asylum wasn't easy to write, and that was coming from the person I was before Crass. I mean, I wrote all of that. The year before Steve and myself started, that's when I was still very deep in whatever it is I'm deep in now, uh, in a in a different way, and there was no one around to help me, and um, and and that's where I like to be. It's interesting you talk about you know that period of people's lives between twenty five and forty, and how that's when the big thinking is, the changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it seems to me that the period of life that you're in now, seventy five to eighty is where the big changes are. And I find that quite inspiring, really, that, you know, that people set on a life course and they gradually live a more and more decayed version of it as they get older, which is understandable. But you're actually still rejuvenating, in a sense. You're still testing yourself. You're still, you're still trying, to find, uh, trying to find something, you know, out there where with, with, you know, with, with deep thinking, philosophy, et cetera, whatever you want to call it, you're still on the journey. And I find that interesting. Well, I, I, it's very, very nice of you to say that. And um, I have always wanted to be living proof that we can do it. We don't need the help of doctors and politicians and experts and professionals. We don't need any of that. We can do it. I believe that the greatest healing of all, and it will get rid of cancer, COVID, whatever you want to is to sit, get out of your own way, because it's you that's in your, in your way, which is actually the cause of sickness. So erase the cause. The only way, you, 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 the effects are nothing. It's the cause. You know, that's why modern medicine, generally speaking, is so ineffective and actually often does more damage than good, because it's not um looking at the cause it's looking at the effects we can all do that bloody hell that's no problem at all uh, go and chew some rosemary and your cough will calm down yeah great that's easy enough that's what cows do uh, mm. or any other animal um it's all there for us it's already available the irish herbalists say you know it's never more than three meters from your door the very herb that you require because these things are inter-responsive. Um, I mean, so that, that's, that's, it's interesting now you said cause and effect. So, but um, would you be more interested in the cause than the effect? I'm not in the least bit interested in effect. It doesn't. The cause is 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 what one should be looking at. Why do I think this way? Um, I mean, the key is complicity always. Um, the effect is always complicit with the cause. The cause is not necessarily complicit with the effect. Uh, and those who didn't take vaccines will know that. You know, they're probably in a much healthier situation generally now than those who did because they haven't given away a part of their sort of whole inner process. You know, the immune system isn't some sort of thing you go and buy off of Amazon, and it certainly isn't some, something you allow people to tamper with on such deeper level as RNA and DNA. And the fact is, sat, the sorry thing is that everyone knows this. But when a fool is a complete fool, and we're not talking about the trickster, when a fool is... A complete fool. They'll do anything rather than to admit it to themselves. 
because actually <laughs> they know that effectively in admitting themselves, their whole sort of egotistical construct will just crumble to the ground and they'll be left devastated. And that's why people are so uptight, why, why you know, the choice is always for bourgeois. It doesn't matter whether you're working class, upper class or middle class, bourgeois is the choice. Um, you know, liberal democracy, wow, that's the choice. That's the bourgeois playground. Um, <laughs> and that's why we're in the mess we're in. <laughs> <laughs>